Hello, good, good evening, everyone. I am Amani Jamal, the Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs, and I welcome you this evening to our discussion. The war between Israel and Hamas is now in its fifth week. SPIA continues to take a leading role in analyzing the situation, providing much needed context and offering possible solutions. Our discussion today focuses on the historical hope of a two-state solution. We are fortunate to have two outstanding panelists, Shai Feldman and Khalil Shikaki, joining us today. Razia will introduce both of them shortly, but I do want to take a moment to say a word about what Khalid and Shai have personally meant to me in my more youthful days, my more youthful, optimistic days, especially amidst this devastating tragedy we continue to witness in the region. The last few weeks have left me nostalgic for the days of the peace process, a process which didn't take us where we needed to go, but nevertheless was potentially a much better place than where we are today. And Shai and Khalil were part of that better and more promising yesterday. Both were dedicated track two negotiators and worked tirelessly to make headway on difficult compromises, formulas and concessions on both ends to find lasting peace. And they, along with track one negotiators, made significant progress when people are so quickly to dismiss the peace process because Camp David failed. What they forget to mention is that tremendous advancement was made in negotiations and compromise. Indeed, more advancement than anything bombs, bullets, and terror have accomplished. For me personally, I always looked forward to seeing Shai and Khalid. They have been a dynamic duo for more than two decades. And when I was still a junior faculty member, significantly younger than both of them, I would eagerly await to hear their news and updates. And each of them would always approach me as sort of like a big brother and say to me, okay, okay, Amani, stop asking us questions. We'll let you know what happened, but you have to promise not to tell anyone. And then they would proceed to say, we made concessions on this issue and we have a good formula on that issue. And not only did they make me feel very, very, very important, um, but they also gave me and so many Palestinians and Israelis who wanted to see peace, wanted a better reality and believed that just because we were born Palestinian or Israeli that we didn't need to be victims of this conflict, this conflict, they gave us hope. I find myself these days longing for this lost hope in these pessimistic and very depressing times. And I hope our conversation tonight can help reshape the conversation and give our students some hope for the future. Our moderator is the former BBC journalist and our colleague Razia Iqbal, a John L. Weinberg, Goldman Sachs and Company visiting professor and lecturer at SPIA, I thank Razia and our panelists, and I look forward to the I look forward to the discussion. Over to you, Razia. My sincere thanks to Dean Jamal and all at Spear for making these panels possible. And thank you all for joining us for this latest panel discussion on events in the Middle East, not only dominating international affairs, but many of our personal conversations too. Perhaps no one needs reminding, but some facts before we begin. Since the latest escalation of violence between the State of Israel and Hamas, more than 1,400 Israelis are dead, including many children. More than 200 people are being held hostage in Gaza. More than 10,000 Palestinians have been killed, among them more than 4,000 children. Today marks one month since the October the 7th attack by Hamas on Israel and the ensuing attack on Gaza by Israel, in which we have seen the shattering of the status quo. A status quo which from the Israeli side amounted to a management of the Palestinian question in Gaza and from the Palestinian side, the continuing endurance of a 17 year blockade. And in those 17 years, there have been many spikes in violence, but nothing on this scale. So much since October the 7th is unprecedented. Around the world, we've seen hundreds of thousands continuing to gather, many calling for a ceasefire or those in positions of power calling for a humanitarian pause in the fighting. 
And when there is a consideration of what might happen next when the fighting stops, there is the invoking of this idea known as the two-state solution. Two peoples, the Israelis and the Palestinians, living side by side in peace and security. An idea that's been around for decades, and for many people, the historic hope of a two-state solution was embodied in the Oslo Accords of 1993. For many others, though, there is disagreement that that moment was ever realistic. Since then, a great deal has changed materially on the ground. So we thought it would be a good idea to talk about this today. We have two eminent figures, as Amani was just telling us to help us do that. Shai Feldman, the Raymond Frankel Chair in Israeli Politics and Society at the Crown Centre for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. Welcome, Shai. And Khalil Shikaki, who is Director and Senior Researcher at the Palestinian Centre for Policy Survey and Research. The two of them, among many other things, are authors along with the Egyptian Abdel Munam Saeed Ali of a book called Arab and Israelis, Conflict and Peacemaking in the Middle East, the first university textbook on the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which was written by an Israeli, a Palestinian and an Egyptian. Welcome to you both. Let's begin first, though, with your assessment on where we are at the moment. It does feel as though the arc of history has bent in a particularly unpredictable way since October the 7th and doesn't appear to leave us with much hope. Shai Feldman, your, your reflections first. Shai, I think you're muted. I need to, need to unmute, okay. Am I unmuted now? You're unmuted now, welcome. <laughs> Uh, no one in the past 50 years was able to mute me, so uh, I'm not <laughs> going to change this now. Um, Amani, thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, the only downside of your introduction is you, you made me feel very old. Um, <laughs> wise, you make you feel wise, sagacious. <laughs> so, much, so much has changed, it's true. Um, where are we? Well, uh, I'll give you my, 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 uh, my sense of where we are um, from a slightly uh, slightly Israeli uh, uh, point of view. Um, basically, uh, we are um, so we're past from we're past uh, exactly a month since the October seven uh, incursion, in which. Uh, as you said, uh, 1,400 uh, mostly civilians uh, were slaughtered and 240 something uh, Israelis, children, old people, whatever, uh, uh, were abducted. Uh, this, from, this for the Israelis is a kind of a 9-11. And uh, um, it's unprecedented uh, in, First of all, in, even even if we dig all the way back to 110 years of uh, Zionist history, uh, there's never been a, uh, uh, something like that. Uh, Israel has never experienced um, 1,400 people dying in a single day. Well, most of them in the in the first day, um, and mostly civilians. Um, so the reaction, not surprisingly, in Israel is not very different from the reactions uh, in this country uh, to 9-11. Uh, this is not a normal um, conflict situation where um, mostly military men uh, or armed men are dealing with armed men. Uh, this, is, this was essentially a, uh, an attack on, on, on civilians with a huge magnitude. Um, and so where are we? We're basically in a situation where Israel has basically pledged uh, a pledge to itself, um, similar to the pledge that President uh, Bush 43 made in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 uh, that had essentially two components to it. One uh, is to eradicate uh, uh, um, Al-Qaeda, and in this case, it's Hamas and to eradicate uh, the leader of Al-Qaeda. Uh, and in this case, 
probably personified by uh, by by Yahya Sinwar. Um, and the military incursion is in its full force. So the stated goal is to uh, eradicate, quote, the, the the fighting power and the governing power of, uh, of of Hamas. And so we're now in this in in the I would say the first phase of a very, very, very violent confrontation in which there are lots of lots of of innocent civilians on the Palestinian side. Uh, finding themselves in the crossfire and losing their lives or losing their family members and, and getting seriously uh, seriously injured. Um, the big question, of course, is where is this heading? Um, what does the day after here look like? Um, so I don't know if you uh, want us to jump into this at such an early point in our discussion. Um, but this is, of course, where the two-state solution, as at least as a, as a conceptual construct, is going to come back. Now, I would just remind the, everybody that another part of the, of the, let's say, background information that we, we, we have to put on the table is the fact that uh, Hamas violently took over Gaza 17 years ago from the Palestinian Authority. And as of that point, uh, the discussion shifted from a two-state solution to a three-state solution. Uh, uh, Hamas per, uh, essentially entrenched itself in Gaza as an independent entity. It, I have to say, on the Israeli side, it served the purpose of those who were against the two-state solution in the first place and could then say, well, you know, the two-state solution is really no, no longer a viable proposition. Now that Hamas has taken over, there's a completely different regime in Gaza as compared to the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And uh, and we've been in this, that was one component of this very unfortunate situation. The second component, and with this I will end in this introduction, uh, regarding the, the feasibility of a two-state solution is, um, well, there are two issues here. This was never a possible, this was never a basis for discussions with Hamas, because Hamas has never gone through the the let's say the, call it the moderating uh, process that the palace that the PLO has gone through, beginning in 1974, through the essentially the declaration of independence of two states in 1988, which became a basis for discussions of a two-state solution uh, with the PLO, and then ending, of course, in the Oslo uh, Accords. The problem with Hamas is it's never gone through this kind of ideological transformation. It remained constantly with this goal of eradicating the state of Israel. And therefore, even uh, more, let's say, modest issues like the so-called ending of the siege, what the background to this created a very negative background because it was ending the siege. It was basically the ending the siege meant that ever, anything could get into Gaza in a situation where Gaza is ruled by Hamas and Hamas remains committed to Israel's destruction. That has always been a problem on uh, on, the, on the Israeli side. And, can, I, uh, can I just quickly, Shai, just can I quickly interrupt you, though? Isn't it also true that Benjamin Netanyahu understood that as long as Hamas was in charge in Gaza, there would be no negotiations over uh, Palestinian statehood. He once said in a Likud meeting that anyone who wants to thwart the establishment of a Palestinian state has to support Hamas and the transference of money to Hamas, that there was a sense of that inside Israeli politics. But this is exactly what I said earlier. I said earlier that the 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 the, the semi independence of Gaza held by Hamas served in the Israeli domestic debate served the people served the camp that was opposed to the to a state so to two state solution. That's been that's been the background uh, of and 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 frankly, I will just end by saying uh, after after the fighting is over. There is going to be a major reckoning in Israel at all level, and one of the one of the main aspects of this reckoning would be exactly to e examine uh, the the wisdom uh, of of this of this doctrine that was at the at the at the basis of of, of the Israeli approach to Gaza and the and the Israeli approach of Hamas. I just hope that on the Palestinian side, 
there will also be a reckoning uh, because every, uh, both sides have to essentially come to grips with the very unfortunate fact that we arrived at this un very unfortunate uh, uh, moment. And somehow, <laughs> anyway. Khalil, Khalil um, Shikaki, let's uh, let's turn to you. Just g give me give me a brief sense of of where you think we're at at the moment, and then let's jump into what might happen the day after the fighting stopped. And 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 then I want to go back to the history a little bit to to talk about the hope that Amani was was mentioning. So Khalil, first your reflections on 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 what the 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 unprecedented nature of the days that that everyone is living through at the moment, and what might happen on the day after after the fighting stops. This war started at a moment in which the support for the two-state solution among Palestinians and Israeli Jews was at uh, the, one of the most, uh, the least level of support uh, since the start of the Oslo process 30 years ago. Um, in the last 10 years, we have seen gradual um, determined decline in support, um, leaving both sides with less than a third, somewhere between a quarter to a third uh, supporting it. The decline in support um, also meant decline in support for all the components that would have required significant concessions from both sides. This decline um, was certainly something that we have never seen before. And um, the joint Israeli-Palestinian surveys that we have been conducting since 2000 have uh, indicated that in the past, we had two thirds or more of Israeli Jews and Palestinians and almost 90% of Israeli Arabs who favored a two-state solution while a majority of Israeli Arabs continue to support it. Um, among Palestinians and Israeli Jews, there is a sense, a very strong sense, that the other side is not interested in peace and that we have no partner. And this perception uh, is compounded by what people see on the ground. This is true for both sides. Israeli Jews and Palestinians also look at the facts on the ground that various Israeli governments have left, that is the expansion of, of, of the settlement enterprise that have, where settlements have been built right deep inside the West Bank, where the future Palestinian state is supposed uh, to be. And, and this has led the Palestinians to come to the conclusion that Israeli Jews cannot be trusted. Uh, they say one thing, but they do something completely different this reality and, and the fact that Israel in since 2009 has essentially been governed by right-wing coalitions and, and, and mostly Netanyahu uh, has, has led to this situation where people see no feasibility, no viability for the two-state solution, thereby uh, basically withholding support. Um, but uh, along with that, we also see militancy. We see militancy again on both sides, the desire to use force since diplomacy isn't working and is not functioning at all. The perception has grown again on both sides that uh, one needs to use force or one needs to live by the sword. These perceptions have also created an environment uh, where uh, the, the two-state solution among those who, who, who supported it um, was becoming uh, less attractive. We've seen people on the Palestinian side mostly moving away from the two-state solution and supporting uh, a one-state solution. Nonetheless, I, 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 and of course the support for the one-state solution was in part based on the perception that the reality on the ground is already a one-state reality and that what Palestinians need to do is to struggle to turn this reality, which is one in which there is sig significant discrimination, systemic and institutional discrimination against Palestinians, uh, that Palestinians should struggle to uh, achieve equal rights with Israeli Jews in a single state. 
whereby between the river and the sea, whereby Israeli Jews and Palestinians would have equal rights. <clears throat> this development has, has shattered this uh, perception that a, a two-state solution is the only viable solution. Uh, and uh, we entered this war with this perception being the prevailing perception. The question is, what is the war going to do to that? Uh, although we have not done surveys uh, in the last, uh, among the Palestinians in the last month, there has been surveys among Israeli Jews. And based on previous examples where there has been bloodshed, exposure to violence and hardships, as the case is today for Palestinians and Israelis, um, we have found that under these conditions, support for compromise decline, and we see significant hardening of attitudes. So the, the problems that we have seen before the war started have essentially been compounded by the scenes that people have seen. The level of distrust on the other side has increased tremendously. The desire to dehumanize the other side has also increased tremendously. There is tremendous denial that the other side uh, is suffering or, or that, the, 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 that one's own side is committing war crimes and atrocities against the other side. This is a situation uh, which we actually haven't seen even during the Second Intifada where significant violence was committed, but this one is much worse than uh, we have seen before. The question is, is whether uh, there's one thing that Chai and you mentioned earlier, which is that the Israeli government during the last 15 years has tried to capitalize on the fact that Hamas violently took over Gaza in order to impede any process towards a two-state solution. Yet now the, the same prime minister who articulated that vision is now saying he wants to eradicate Hamas. But by eradicating Hamas, let's assume that is feasible for him to do. Uh, by eradicating Hamas, he actually deprives himself with the reasoning of why there should be no two-state solution. And the question might be, uh, it, it, what is more important to him, to eradicate Hamas or to eradicate the two-state solution? If he remains the prime minister, I'm actually tending to believe that he might actually think eradicating the two-state solution is more important to him and to Israel, to the Israel he wants, than eradicating Hamas, and that it might be easier for him to make peace with Hamas eventually than to make peace with the two-state solution. Well, that, that's a, a, a fascinating insight. I, I, I wonder, though, if we can just um, just pause for a moment there in terms of what we're looking at right now and, and, and go back a little. Shai, I wonder how much, if you can articulate for us, how much hope there was back in that period of, I suppose, three years between 91 and 94, often spoken of as a kind of golden era and potential for the possibility of a two-state solution. Oh, you're on mute again, I think, Shai. Yeah, well, I, we were asked to unmute, to mute. <laughs> anyway, um, this was, a, as Amani uh, reminded us, uh, this was a period of great hope. Uh, because, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, many people, uh, on, I, 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 I'll say on the Israeli side, you know, were used to refer to uh, Fatah and the PLO uh, for a, a number of decades since uh, uh, since the Fatah was uh, established in the mid 1960s as, as primarily a terrorist organization and uh, and uh, saw on the White House lawn uh, Yasser Arafat and uh, Itzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres. Uh, signing the Oslo Accords and shaking hands. Um, and, uh, and now the problem is, of course, is that the, the, there were circumstances that allowed this to happen. And these circumstances were difficult to replicate in, 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 the, in the future years. This was um, 
a situation where we were just after uh, the Gulf War uh, the, and, and the end of the Cold War, the U.S. had sway. It was a unipolar moment. The U.S. Uh, had considerable influence. Um, in, in the Middle East, uh, Saddam was, uh, uh, was defeated and the correlation of forces in the Middle East favored the moderates uh, at the expense of the, or against the radicals uh, and, and so on. So, so yes, so that was a, that was a period of, of great hope. Um, it manifested itself in that a very, very, very large number of, of, uh, of countries that did not have any uh, diplomatic relations with Israel established these uh, diplomatic relations. Um, uh, and, uh, um, you know, I think that all this was all this was uh, uh, associated with a, a time of great optimism. Foreign investments uh, in Israel, uh, um, you know, the, the, ni the 1990s, which is to say the years following Oslo, was a time of great economic rejuvenation in, in, in Israel. So... It, there, there is reason for Amani to be uh, nostalgic to these uh, years. Uh, I think uh, all of us are. And, and, then, and, and yes, then, I, I, I wonder if I can turn to to, to Khalil to to reflect on on the fact that you know there was disappointment so quickly for all kinds of reasons which we won't go into now. But the Oslo Accords never mentioned Palestinian statehood. The issue of the return of the refugees was something that so many people who were involved in the process. Uh, felt was uh, a betrayal in some way. I, I, I wonder whether that informs, to some extent, how things developed from, from the 90s onwards. Opa, now you're mute. <laughs> Can we just make a decision that no one's going to mute themselves in between because it's, okay. it's just taking up time? <laughs> There was a period of, of euphoria, support for the Oslo process in September 1993 exceeded two thirds among the Palestinians. Nonetheless, even on that day when, uh, when Palestinians were asked about Oslo, uh, there was considerable criticism of the entire structure of Oslo, including these issues. Most Palestinians, when we asked them back then in September 1993 about each aspect of the Oslo process, the strong opposition was expressed about postponing um, the what was called the final status issues and the fact that this was about self-rule rather than uh, an independent state, the fact that the Palestinians were promised things uh, that uh, were subject to further negotiations, that this was an open-ended process, uh, that the settlement construction were not explicitly uh, prohibited. Uh, these were significant um, cautious aspects that Palestinians were fully aware of at that time. But the most uh, dramatic negative impact uh, to Oslo, in fact, came soon in, in 1994 with the Baruch Goldstein massacre at the Ibrahimi Mosque that uh, gave, uh, gave the Palestinians about six months uh, of rethinking about the entire Oslo process and gave Hamas the opportunity to launch the suicide attacks that will come to characterize Israeli-Palestinian interaction at the violent level during the 90s, let alone, of course, uh, during the Second Intifada. And that issue of, of violence, uh, in addition to Palestinian complaints about the Israelis um, not, not spelling out the end result, the end game, and continuing to build settlements and to continue to uh, uh, to, to uh, delay implementation and transfer of jurisdiction over land and functions and so on, uh, these were uh, leaving a very negative impact. Nonetheless, um, throughout the 90s, uh, you, you are right to call them the golden era for the peace process because 
uh, until the collapse of Camp David negotiations, the support for that process was still very high and support for diplomacy and negotiations, which today is dismal. At that time, even during the Second Intifada, um, and, and, and the great support for violence that Palestinians expressed at that time, there was still significant belief that diplomacy uh, can still deliver, uh, now adjusted to say uh, that, that diplomacy also needed to be affirmed through violence. So violence was seen as a continuation of politics by other means for Palestinians at that early period. Now we don't see diplomacy at all being um, seen as viable by the Palestinians, unlike the situation back then. So there, there is no doubt that the early period of the Oslo process was one of hope uh, and, 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 in fact, willingness to make a lot of concessions that people are now very, very reluctant um, to, to, to accept. And there is no doubt that the perception of the other side as a partner for peace during the 90s um, was still very, very high. And Palestinians had uh, very positive things to say, but even about Prime Minister uh, Rabin at that time, who, whom the Palestinians, of course, remember from the first intifada uh, as the man ordering uh, to, to, to break the bones of the Palestinian protesters. So clearly uh, there was a period in which the Palestinians um, did see Israelis as partners in peace. And, and this has been extremely helpful for the Palestinian leadership, uh, which received significant legitimacy by signing that agreement, but also through elections afterwards, which brings us to where we are now, where we don't see that. And, and, and this obviously complicates the picture uh, that I painted earlier of, of, of how bad things are uh, or where as, as we enter this war and how much worse it might have gotten since we started this war. Indeed, no elections in Gaza since 2006 and no elections. Mahmoud Abbas has been uh, the head of the PA for 18 years, having been voted in for uh, those first four. Um, I, I, I wonder then if we can, can just, just focus. Yes, can I, go ahead. Can I just add another another dimension? Uh, obviously, Khalid is, is, is correct uh, in, in, in his portrait. Uh, but I want to get to another dimension of uh, of of what was what was um, the 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 deficiency? Um, where where were where was the where were the mines in this field that caused uh, the dreams uh, that we had in the early nineties to 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 vanish? I think that we have to remember that Oslo was a bet. Um, the bet had at least two components to it. Um, this, was a, this was not a solution. Oslo was not a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Oslo was an agreement on opening a different process for dealing with the conflict. And in that sense, it was an open-ended process. In other words, both parties came went into this wedding but without any promise of what the final outcome of this process is going to look like. Now, in retrospect, and to some extent, some even immediately noticed the the, the shortcoming uh, of uh, of something that naturally didn't didn't satisfy either the Israelis or the Palestinians because it didn't bring an end to their conflict. But the reason why Oslo uh, was Oslo is because of the realization that at that point in time, which is to say 1993, the gap at that time in the fundamental positions about the most important aspects of the dimensions of the conflict was too wide to be able to bridge. And therefore the bet was, well, instead, let's agree on a process that uh, uh, that hopefully would lead us to this to this uh, solution, and of course uh, we know we know how that ended, but but uh, in, in most cases you see, it's even in real time it's easy 
it, it's very, very easy to poke holes in proposals. It's much more difficult to come up with with suggestions that that actually that have, that have lesser uh, uh, problems and 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 uh, minefields uh, than than the proposal adopted. So that's that's one aspect of the bet. The other aspect of the bet is that uh, and is that uh, is that both sides, which is to say the Israeli let's call it security community. And and and, uh, and and the same applies to 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 Arafat and the Palestinian security community. Both sides failed to deal with the extremists on each side that became the spoilers. Okay, the Israeli security community could not conceive of a Jewish terrorist murdering the Israeli prime minister, and that happened. That was a complete surprise because conceptually. It was considered impossible to happen, and and so on. Uh, uh, right after that, or parallel to that, the Israeli security community was also in conversation with uh, with Arafat and with the Palestinian security community, and the Israelis the Israeli side warned the Palestinians, if you don't take care of your spoilers, which is to say Hamas. You're going to be very, very, very sorry. So, uh, and Arafat thought that somehow he could bridge this gap. He could make, he could somehow control the, the spoilers on the Palestinian side. But then, what happened is Rabin was assassinated. Ferris replaced Rabin, and Hamas launched the, the the terrorist attacks, which brought about the Israeli disappointment in the marriage called Oslo. Which, which, without which, you can't understand how Netanyahu won the 1996 elections. Well, let, let's uh, let's talk about uh, what the what the circumstances of today might, what kinds of parts of what's happening at the moment might lend itself to uh, any hope at all after the fighting stops. There are two things I want you both to reflect on for me. The, the fact that Joe Biden has apparently told Prime Minister Netanyahu that things cannot go back to the status quo on October the 6th. We have heard not just from him, but from Anthony Blinken and many other people that the two-state solution is the only option on the table. And we know that materially on the ground, how difficult that would be given the lack of um, any potential uh, contiguous Palestinian independent state in the West Bank, for example, given the number of settlements that have been built on, on the West Bank. But what does he mean when he says that? And also, what does it mean when Prime Minister Netanyahu says that uh, Israel doesn't want to govern Gaza? He talks about an international coalition, possibly local political leaders, a coalition of the US, EU, etc., possibly taking power in Gaza but also says that Israel will be in charge of security, and that appears to mean occupation by any other name. Khalil, let's start with you on, on the issue of what you think world leaders, including Biden, mean when they say that, that the two-state solution is the only option on the table, given, given what we've just heard about how and why it failed. Well, there is no doubt that this has been the U.S. position for a very long time. And there is no doubt that the U.S. is indeed in favor of a, a two-state solution outcome. Um, but the U.S., uh, this Biden administration has done little to advance the two-state solution on the ground. To advance the two-state solution, uh, you need to provide a diplomatic forum. You need to provide a vision. You need to revive a roadmap that takes us there. And you need to take advantage of the current crisis to do that. And it is now one full month after the eruption of this war, and we have not seen the Biden administration coming up with a clear vision as to how one should utilize this crisis in order uh, to come up with a constructive plan for the future, for the day after. The difficulty of reaching a, any kind of this, of, of beginning any kind of useful discussion about it, um, is indeed the outcome of the lack of vision. I cannot expect the Palestinians and the Israelis to be able to develop this vision right now, 
And I think the region, despite its desire to play a significant role in pushing forward in that direction, again, the region is fully in favor of a two-state solution as well, uh, as well as Europe. And, and, and so the U.S. needs to lead. No, if, even if the U.S. fails to lead, no one else is going to be able to lead. In any case, only the U.S. has the kind of leverage on Israel. Uh, to and on the region to be able to build such a coalition, Biden has not yet developed that vision, has not yet articulated a roadmap to get there, has not yet linked uh, this to the day after in Gaza, has not yet created a coalition in the region whereby the regional environment would provide the kind of um, a, 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 an environment conducive uh, to the Israelis and the Palestinians to come forward in a regional uh, peace deal uh, that involves major Arab countries and Israel, but also uh, produce uh, at, at the end of the negotiating process a, a two-state solution, a Palestinian state living side by side with the state of Israel. That uh, lack of initiative on the part of the U.S., is at the heart of the problem today. The longer uh, the U.S. avoids articulating this vision, the more difficult it will be to influence not just the day after, but the direction of the current fighting. Where is it leading? Without such a, a clear vision, the, the current fighting on the ground might actually produce highly negative and undesirable uh, results that might, it, might make it more difficult for the Israelis and the Palestinians to come to terms on the day after. If Israel is to implement its current two basic goals of destroying Hamas military as well as Hamas's governing institutions, Israel will reoccupy the entire Gaza Strip. And in doing so, Israel will be forced to be in charge of governance, not just security. Who is going to replace Israel after that will depend on whether we have an alternative reality, a vision, and, and, and actors who are willing to replace the Israeli army. To be frank, right now, the only actor who would be willing to say goodbye to the Israelis and to take control of Gaza from the Israelis is Hamas. No one else, no one in the region, and certainly not the Palestinian Authority, uh, and certainly not the international community will be willing to do anything other than service delivery and humanitarian support. But to take on responsibility for the entire Gaza Strip in terms of security, law enforcement, and governance in Gaza will require this vision that the US is currently not providing, and it will make it more difficult because then you have to negotiate with Israel, it's withdrawal. And I can't see anyone, as I said, who would be able to exert the kind of pressure if the US is not exerting that pressure right now on the Israelis to endorse that vision. Yeah, just, to, just to clarify what you're saying, that you, you're, you're essentially saying that the mission that Israel has set itself to eradicate Hamas, and we know that it's many things, it has a politburo outside the country, it's a militia, it's a governing force inside Gaza, it's a social and welfare and religious organization, it's many things. So you're basically saying that that will not be possible, Israel will not fulfill its mission, and ultimately the only group that may well be willing to take Gaza on is still. Hamas. Yes, uh, uh, unless Israel is willing to meet the demands of those other actors that Israel might wish to invite to take control of Gaza from it. And, and, and that brings us back to the two-state solution. But it is Netanyahu has done his best to avoid confronting this issue and hiding behind Hamas and strengthening Hamas in Gaza, essentially giving Gaza to Hamas to control uh, and, and consolidate as its own state and de denying the Palestinians the ability, therefore, to have an independent and sovereign state uh, in both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. This is the man who will then have to decide once Israel reoccupy the entire Gaza Strip, what to do with it. Would he be willing to now 
abandon that position and endorse a two-state solution, if the U.S. is not now providing Israel or asking Israel to endorse this vision, then it will be too late. The leverage that the U.S. has right now on Israel is tremendous. Once Israel reoccupies the entire Gaza Strip, the leverage that the U.S. will have in Israel will be much less than it is now. If the Biden administration is serious about the two-state solution, it should have articulated that vision on day one of the crisis. Ty Feldman, what do you make of this analysis? Well, <clears throat> so look, first of all, I think that um, it, these the circumstances right now make it very, very, very difficult to have a, a rational conversation. The level of anger that uh, exists still a month later on the Israeli side, and I bet the situation is similar on the Palestinian side, <clears throat> it makes it very, very difficult uh, to, to have this kind of rational conversation. I think that if the Americans came with any plan right now, right now, um, <clears throat> I don't think there's even, the people wouldn't even listen <laughs> in, in, any, in any meaningful way. So that's number one. Number two is I wouldn't pay much attention, frankly, to what various Israeli members of the Israeli government are saying, what uh, you know will happen or won't happen in the Gaza Strip, uh, presumably after Hamas is, uh, is defeated. There has been no, no institutional and, or even semi-institutional or even informal serious discussion on the Israeli side about the day after that you we can you know we can criticize this or not but the reality is that and it's tied to my first point that whenever this comes up everybody says against every sort of the, the, the kind of accepted consensus is let's let's first defeat those who are responsible for the massacre of October 7 and then we'll deal with the day after I'm, I'm just I'm just saying this is the situation that's number two. <clears throat> number three is, I think, and this is where I kind of, I don't disagree with anything that Khalil said, but I disagree with the relative weight that Khalil places on the issue of what Netanyahu will agree to and what Netanyahu will not agree to. Netanyahu, in my view, is going to go away. He is part, of the, his, he and his group are in the worse situation than the Israeli leadership in the immediate aftermath of the 1973 war and surprise, okay? Golda Meir, Moshe Dayan survived for a few months and then they became history until Dayan played actually some years later a very positive role to some extent trying to uh, compensate for the negative role that he played in years earlier by supporting the peace process with Egypt and supporting uh, 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 Begin's decision to withdraw to the last square inch of, of the Sinai uh, Peninsula uh, uh, to abide by the by the essentially the demand of Anwar Sadat when when he came to to Israel. But this strata of leaders has has gone because of the fact that not only was Israel surprised, but that the reckoning was people Israelis understood that the basis, the, the assumptions that drove Israeli policy from the 1967 euphoria to October 1973 was faulty, and everybody who was associated with that had to had, had to go. Netanyahu is finished. It's going to take four months, six months, eight months. You can just see on his face. You can see he's 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 gone. So so I think that to focus too much on what Netanyahu will agree to and whether it contradicts what he stood for in the, in, in the past or not is, is so. Now, the, third, the fourth and last point I want to make is this. Again, any, what's, what's the real alternative vision here? The real alternative vision is to bring to the equation those that essentially on the Palestinian side personified the hopes that Amani started our discussion with. And that's the Palestinian Authority. Okay, now it's true. Number one, the Palestinian Authority in its current state is too weak. Number two, it's also true that Israel contributed to its weakness. 
and and and, and so on. However, however, there's no alternative to the Palestinian Authority. So now when 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 we say, well, okay, so let's think about the following scenario that in in uh in for an interim period, some kind of a coalition of Arab countries who have already expressed their clear commitment to peace, which is Egypt, Jordan, the Abraham Accords countries, and Saudi Arabia that was leaning seriously towards normalization with Israel, have a vested interest for geopolitical and geoeconomic interests in peace, would, uh, would play a role in, in essentially stabilizing the Gaza Strip, while steps that would require a big change on the Israeli side would be taken to strengthen the Palestinian Authority and, and to produce essentially a real partner within a span of two years, three years, four years, I don't know what. Now, in all these discussions, everybody basically points to the fact that why would the Arab states take this you know, upon themselves? They know that you know, Gaza is, there is a sense of hopelessness about, you know, about saving the Palestinians and so on. Most of these countries have had bad experiences trying to, for example, negotiate Palestinian reconciliation and so on. There's a Palestinian fatigue. Right now, there's a rally around the flag to some extent. But there is a fun, there's been a fundamental fatigue of the Palestinian issue among Arab countries. So again, it's 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 uh, it's easy to poke holes in this kind of scenario. The problem is that these kind, of, but the, where I see the weakness in this argument is that it doesn't take it. It focuses on the risks and the costs that Arab states would be taken upon themselves if they try to play this positive role. But I think that when the time comes. The Arab states would also have to calculate what right, what kind of risks and costs are in, associated with not taking this step, with not taking this step, with not contributing to stabilize Gaza at least for a, for an interim period during which the Palestinian Authority uh, could be strengthened. And so I think the calculation, two months from now, three months from now, of the same states that right now show so no enthusiasm for getting into this ditch. I think may change, and their behavior, I think, may change. Just We have just a few minutes left, um, and I want both of you really quite briefly to reflect on the reckoning. You've both talked about the reckoning that will have to come in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of the fighting stopping. It, Shai, let's stay with you. I mean, inside Israel, do you think there will be a recognition that the way in which the management of the Palestinian question has been going on for many decades now is untenable if Israel is to have security and peace? So my answer is yes. And I think also that um, th there has been over this last year a, a fundamental change in Israeli domestic politics that is actually going to make um, this more possible. And the change that I'm talking about is the fact that for, for reasons that have nothing to do with the cre present crisis, although um, although they may have contributed to Hamas's estimate that they have an opportunity in front of them, Israel was engaged in a very, very deep debate about changes that the Israeli, the current Israeli government was trying to implement. The result of that was that a quarter of a million Israelis were on the street Saturday after Saturday for 40 Saturdays. Okay, now what is the, the most important long-term uh, impact of, of, of those protests is that these, the center, the Israeli center that was dormant since the beginning of the second intifada is now back, and that means that the that the the kind of the 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 void, the the emptiness of the of the of the center, the fact that the center went to sleep twenty three years ago, is what allowed the right wing to essentially determine the agenda. The right wing has lost the ability to 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 control the agenda, and and uh, in, in in the polls that are conducted in Israel. You see that in 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 the elections, um, you know when people are asked, well, if elections were held today, well, the 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 coalition that now essentially controls the government, they basically lose 
by about 10 or 12 seats in, in the Knesset. In other words, they don't have a majority. They lost their majority. So I think that number one, yes, there's going to be a major reckoning, which is to say it's going to go way beyond firing what, whoever is deemed responsible for what happened on October 7. It's going to touch upon the fundamental assumptions that, drove, that they drove Israeli policy over the last 15 years. And a reckoning means asking difficult questions about these assumptions, just like just like the reaction in Israel after the 1970 surprise was questioned the fundamental assumptions that drove Israeli policy between 1967 and 1973. Look, Khalil, let's just get your take, and then we're going to have to we're going to have to close. I mean, it, it, there certainly have been polls that you have been involved in uh, right up until October the 7th in terms of what Palestinians in Gaza think about Hamas and where their uh, loyalty lies in terms of whether they think Hamas is pursuing the right strategy or not. What kind of reckoning do you think there will be inside the, the, the collective whole of Palestinians, if it's possible to speak about them in that way? Uh, what, what I, right now, of course, one cannot really predict what is going to happen, depending on, on how this war ends. But certainly the suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza will delay any reckoning that might happen. Um, and we will see the Palestinians continuing in this, in the current denial, uh, in which they will continue to see the problem uh, in Israel and not seeing themselves as contributing to it. This is uh, to be expected, and I, I doubt very much that we will see any kind of reckoning immediately. Uh, nonetheless, I think the minute that the Palestinians begin to see that there is an alternative path uh, to ending the occupation and building their own state other than violence, that this will bring about the desired reckoning in which Palestinians will be willing to look themselves in the face both with regard to Hamas and what Hamas did and what Abbas has done during the last 15 years in the West Bank. This, the time for this has not yet come, but I, I'm, I'm almost certain that it will come at, at one point in the future. Hamas was losing support just before the start of the war. In fact, the survey you are referring to <clears throat> indicate, and the surveys that were done in the months up to that, were indicating that people were becoming much more critical of Hamas than they have been before. And that, in fact, in Gaza in particular, there was significant disappointment and disillusionment with Hamas and with Hamas's vision. And we started to see Gazans, in fact, becoming a lot more moderate than the West Bank. The West Bank was not becoming more moderate. In fact, it was becoming more hardline. And that is because of the settler violence in the West Bank and because of what Abbas was doing in the West Bank. The internal Palestinian difficulties uh, the, the, what the Israeli government was doing, <clears throat> the exposure to violence in the last two years, have hardened attitudes in the West Bank, but attitudes in Gaza were reflecting the disillusion with Hamas. Now, the war might have uh, delayed and might delay any further uh, reckoning with Hamas in Gaza. And I hope that in the West Bank, there will be uh, a lot more reckoning a lot earlier and then we will see in the Gaza Strip, but I have no doubt that there will be a lot of reckoning on the Palestinian side as well. Well, given how uh, desperately bleak and grim the picture is on the ground at the moment, uh, perhaps we can hold on to some glimmer of hope that the reckoning that may come in both um, in both sides uh, may present us with the possibility of those hard questions being answered in a positive way. Khalil Chikaki and Shai Feldman, thank you both so much for, for joining us today. And thank you all for being with us this evening. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Amani. Thank you. Thank you, Shai, Khalil, and Razia. And thank you to all our viewers. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you.